Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started here in just a moment. Give another, I don't know, say 30 seconds for our audience to join on here. We have our very own Leslie Amadio from our team in the chat today as our community coordinator. So wherever you're joining from, say hello there to Leslie. Let us know where you're joining from. I don't know, tell us the weather, where you're at. It's rainy and foggy and misty here. Uh, and then also uh, let us know kind of your role at your organization, what you do. We love the engagement. And then I'm going to kick off here in just a moment with announcements. We'll intro our speakers and we'll, we'll dive right in. Okay, awesome. We're about a minute, a little over a minute and a half past, so we'll kick off for the sake of time. And uh, I see the audience is filling up here. So welcome, everybody. I am Jeffrey Richardson, uh, Director of Product Marketing here at Coachava. And uh, we're delighted to have you here with us today for this webinar, Unpacking All Things uh, Data Clean Rooms. Uh, very fascinating, somewhat technical topic. Um, so we've got some great experts here to unpack that for us. Before I introduce our panelists. I want to go through a couple of announcements. So number one, uh, please connect with us in the chat. Ask questions. Um, you'll see a chat tab on your right side, and there's also a Q&A tab over there as well. So you can submit questions through either one. Uh, Leslie Amadio is our community coordinator today. So if you do ask a question in the chat, she will make sure it gets moved over to Q&A. We will try to tackle as many of those questions as possible. Uh, and we love that engagement, so so please chime in. Uh, second, uh, the webinar is being recorded, so it will be made available on demand, and we will send out about a day after, uh, so tomorrow at some point, with a link to watch the webinar on demand. So if there's parts you want to catch again, anything you missed, um, keep an eye out for that. Uh, also, we have a number of great resources from both Coachava and IAB Tech Lab, our, our guests here today, on data clean rooms, uh, and some other interesting topics that we'll unpack. So if you want to explore those further, visit that docs tab on that right side, right to the left, and you can open those resources and other windows to explore after the event today. And then follow us online. We're on uh, Facebook, we're on X slash Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, so connect with Coachava and Coachava Foundry on our socials so we can continue the discussion there. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and bring up our speakers onto the stage so we can go through introductions here and uh, and dive into today's agenda. So welcome Ethan, Grant, and Miguel. Welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, let's Thanks. go ahead and let's go through uh, intros on the order we have on the slide, starting with you, uh, Miguel, as our guest from IAB Tech Lab. Yeah, for sure. Uh, hi everyone, my name is uh, Miguel Morales from IAB Tech Lab. I'm the director of addressability in pets, and I'm very uh, grateful to be talking about uh, data clean rooms today. Good to have you. Awesome. Uh, my name is Ethan Lewis. I'm the CTO of Coachava. Uh, same as Miguel. Really excited to be talking about data clean rooms. Thrilled to be on the the webinar, especially with the IAB. You know, we we definitely uh, follow a lot of their standards. I'm excited to be walking through those with you guys today. Uh, Located in Sandpoint, Idaho, I've been with the company for a little over eight years. Um, I know we're doing some weather uh, announcements. It's uh, a little rainy and cloudy, as Jeff mentioned, but um, the uh, the fun fact about me is that's somewhat my favorite weather. So I'm in a good part of the <laughs> good part of the <laughs> the United States to to have that. Love love the overcast. Um, I'll I'll finalize with one comment: is uh, you know I I spend a lot of the time uh, focused on privacy enhancing technologies at Coachava. Um, do get the luxury of working with a lot of data clean rooms uh, as you know POCs and understanding how our brands could use them um, and also how we can leverage that as some some really cool techniques that I think we'll cover here today. Um, and then lastly, thought provoking, maybe a little bit. I spent a lot of time here recently with Gen AI. I don't think data clean rooms and Gen AI are that far apart. Um, so mm -hmm. if we get a chance to talk a little bit about that in the q and I, I think that's a, a fun topic as well. That's me. Like it. I like it. Oh, interesting. I super want to come back to that. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Yeah. I'm, I'm Grant Simmons from uh, Coachava Foundry. Just a quick blurb on Foundry here real quick. We've been hosting these webinars um, throughout the year, and we're going to continue in January. So, um, you know, tune in. The next one will be sort of a readout on CES. It'll probably be a little 
sort of think connected device smart TV heavy, if that's that's something of interest. But a couple of things. First off, ask as many questions as you can. If we don't get to the questions in the webinar, we always do a written write up at the end um, to include everybody's questions. And if we get repeats, it's not the end of the world. We'll we'll combine those ourselves. So we you know we want folks coming out of here armed. And really, that's what Foundry is all about. So we'll get into some of the clean room tech we built. We'll get into what the future holds. And, and the thing that I want folks to understand is, you know, when we look at this, we look at it through a performance lens. And we're, we're fastly approaching a world where the mobile ad ID is going away and the IP is expected to do a heck of a lot more work. And I, I think it's reasonable to assume that the IP is at, at risk as well. The good news is you're covered. And clean rooms actually do a lot of work in that, along with your first party data. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to get into this stuff. I think it's it's a future state. I think it's in its nascent phase relative to mobile performance reporting. And with that, I'll shut up and we can get, get going. No, oh, I love it. Well, welcome, Grant, Ethan, Miguel. Um, well, yeah, we're going to kick off. I, I just launched a poll uh, in the polls tab. So everyone in the audience should have gotten a little nudge uh, to take a peek at that and vote. So if you can go ahead and uh, chime in there now and let us know if you have used data clean rooms for advertising, targeting, activation, or measurement, we want to just kind of gauge the audience on, on where you sit with DCR adoption. And DCR, I think, is, is an acronym we'll probably use. So we don't have to say data clean rooms every time, but <laughs> I know uh, acronyms are, are not always apparent. So DCR equals data clean rooms. And I didn't just make that up. That is official, right? Right, everybody? That's an official acronym? It okay. is now, sure. It's another three-letter acronym in this yeah. space. Why not? Yeah, yeah. All right, so interesting. So it looks like we got about, let's see, I'll let this bake a bit longer. Um, I don't know if Ethan, Grant, or Miguel, um, as these results come in, uh, where you think data cleanroom adoption sits, or if any of these poll results surprise you at all. Seems no, about I, right I to think, me. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think this is uh, right in line with what I would have expected. And I, I think that uh, encouraging to see that some folks are starting to experiment with them or, or use them, but uh, not a surprise for sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to leave this poll open in the background, so folks, feel free to, to keep uh, chiming in if you haven't already. Um, I won't close that out. Uh, and then what I'm going to do now is uh, quickly just touch on our agenda for today. So, Grant, you already kind of mentioned this a little bit, but we're going to just quickly kind of do a backdrop of Data Clean Rooms 101 and then look at some really interesting use cases. Uh, so, DCR in the real world that Grant and, and his team at Foundry have, have worked on. And then um, we're going to go through some IAB Tech Lab DCR guidance, best practices, some of the standardization stuff that they're working on, which is really exciting. And then we'll wrap up looking at the future of DCR really in ad tech. Uh, so, with that, let's kick off by um, talking about really what are data clean rooms. So Ethan, could you um, sound off on this first and then Miguel and Grant, I'd love for you to chime in too on this front. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think I'm not gonna read the slide directly, but really at, at the whole data clean rooms are, are really similar to traditional databases that, that you've been seeing with, uh, you know, some of the, the key features being things like data isolation, increased privacy measures that are taking place uh, usually through something like privacy enhancing technologies that I'm sure we'll get into later and a lot of the access controls. Um, so what data clean rooms really bring to the table through again, more, more similar to traditional database technologies is a way for parties to securely join data without overexposing the data that they, they're sitting on. So a good use case to think about would be if you know, a, a brand advertiser is wanting to share some of their first party data with one of the publishers that they're running campaigns on. In the past, you know, that that's something that we could do very easily by doing flat file transfers or uploading and sharing, uh, inserting into a database and doing some data science work, perhaps to see the performance of, of a campaign or working directly with an MMP to uh, look at real time signals. Uh, data clean rooms are, are really coming into the bridge to, to bridge that privacy gap to say, hey, when things like identifiers that are common across parties or IP addresses, which are common uh, across parties go away, how do we not expose the data that we're sitting on, but still get access to that performance data? 
So at a really high level, I would say, think of a database on steroids, uh, protecting a lot of privacy for, for not only your company, but the consumers that you should, you have access to as well. Yeah. Yeah. And Miguel, any, any additional commentary on just PETs uh, specifically as, as a, one of the backbones of, of how DCRs operate? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think uh, it's sort of like a layered approach. Um, you know, at the very core, it's like Ethan said, it's like a database, but you can layer on uh, security depending on the, you know, sort of the, the features of the clean room. You can start with encryption uh, at like, uh, you know, things like differential privacy. Uh, and the more you add, the more security it provides. Uh, but yeah, you basically start with a, with a database and then you can layer on those pets um, and they all basically just enhance uh, enhance the the security features and privacy features of the clean room. But at, at the core, it is essentially just like a shared database. Yeah. And then um, misconception wise, and you know, I'm, I'm just like there was that whole thing where a lot of people are, you know, saying, oh, we're powered by AI, right? And I think, um, what is it, one of the one of the agencies came out and said, well, you can't say that unless you're actually powered by AI. Let's, you know, so if we think about misconceptions around data clean rooms and what they are not, um, can one of you just walk us through a couple of misconceptions and how you know something isn't a DCR? Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, again, not to just call out some of these points, but, um, you know, anytime you're getting access to row level, especially when it's an overlap analysis and you're seeing uh, more data than you have access to as a first party, that's certainly not a data clean room. Um, that is where we're doing a lot of cross data sharing and what we would say is an overexposure of data across two individual parties. Um, you know, beyond that, I, I think that a lot of stress is put on how data is shared and joined. There's a lot of a lot of techniques out in the space that um, I, I don't want to say it in a, a overly negative term, but they're they're masquerading as a data clean room. But the techniques on how you join data and share data do not follow a lot of the privacy guarantees that DCR really aims to, to push out. So I'm um, an example of that would be if you're uploading your first party data to a public S3 bucket or a, an S3 bucket that uh, party A and party B have access to in order to enrich data in a DCR, those techniques don't typically come with the same privacy guarantees that something like a full-fledged DCR have, have access to. Um, so it's nuanced, but a lot of the privacy controls uh, need to be there for a full-fledged DCR. Yeah. Anything else you'd add to that, Grant or Miguel? Yeah, I think of it more sort of from a business rule standpoint, meaning if if any of the involved parties could use the data as a vector to get to identity, it's missed its mark. Hmm. And while it's while you can think of it as sort of this this database on steroids, and we'll get into it here in a couple minutes, um, the arguments and the measurement itself take can take place in that environment. So even that's obfuscated, and so. It's 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 both the data storage, the data joining, and it's also the interrogation of that data. And um, it creates a lot of privacy. Not a lot of folks get access to it, um, and there's a lot of opportunity, particularly if you're if you're using an SDK. Mm -hmm. I recorded a video, which I think is linked up here, in terms of just an overview of 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 data clean rooms that I think provides at least within sort of performance marketing um, a pretty good overview if if folks are interested. Yeah, check that out. It's in the it's in the docs tab um, as one of the resources. It's how DCRs work. Um, and let me do this. I'm going to share the. I left that poll open in the background for a little bit longer. So this is, I think, about our final take on this before I'll close this out. But so interesting, you know, about 15% have used DCR in some way. Uh, about 38 plus percent no, but almost 50%. Not yet, but planning to. So hopefully this is a very helpful uh, discourse for, for that group today. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll close that out. Um, and let's go ahead and let's jump in. Um, I think it helps to, to speak through a real world use case of DCR in action. So um, Grant, I'm going to share the screen here. Cool. Uh, slide and I'll let you talk us through and just let me, when you're ready for that next slide, just let me know and I'll, I'll progress forward. Yeah, I appreciate it. We've got a, a couple couple issues going on with this measurement. We've done a couple measurements like this, but we have we have two parties. In this case, we have the brand who's buying the ads and they are very protective of their data. They don't share nor leak 
anything in terms of uh, IP identifiers or maids. And they obfuscate all of the events that are taking place in the app so they're non-human readable. I mean, very, very privacy centric. So despite that, they wanna measure the effectiveness on in this case an MVPD, right? So think like a big cable carrier. And so when we look at that cable carrier itself, they too have a bunch of restrictions and, and actually have to adhere to like regulation in terms of aggregation rules. And the reason they do that is because they too have their, their own unique identifiers, which they can use, which in their world stitch back to actual customers. And so both parties want to use all of this sweet data, but they don't want any party to be able to access the others. And so while a clean room can solve either one of their challenges in combination, it sort of solves both. And if we go on to the next slide here, I'm not going to walk through this whole thing, but, but if we look at that last column that says Kuchava, that's the clean room environment itself. And so if we follow that, that top thread, that is ingesting and adorning the ad signal with their proprietary identifiers pulled into a clean room. The bottom row is, is largely the conversion side of the equation. So think of what they're doing in, in, uh, in this case in the app and the website. And this measurement was all about sort of an ongoing episode or, or show that had weekly episodic views. And they wanted to understand what's the incremental increase in that. And so, when we look at that, that last slot there, that's where the clean room lives. And in this case, we use the AWS clean room, whereby we pull in and adorn the data. Uh, it's obfuscated to all parties. And then the measurement itself takes place in the clean room. And so no party can actually see the logic that is equating the measurement itself, which is, is again, um, very, very protecting of this case, the brand Superstore. And so if we go on to the next slide, the overall, there was a lot of findings in this campaign. And, and this was from um, a couple of years ago, and we've now done it sort of year over year um, and are, are sort of in the middle of it again this year, again, using CleanRoom. But what we see is we can see the ongoing incrementality of viewership to this, to this show decreases as the season progresses with a couple of extrinsic factors. There was a very extrinsic factor on that fifth event. And then the last one was sort of another uh, big premiere event. So um, very, very reasonable, very, very uh, quick. As soon as we get the data flowing, it, it, it reads out. So Jeff, let's go to the next slide here real quick. Yeah. And then in terms of all the, the different outcome types we pulled in for this, this uh, exercise, mobile app activity, so think installs, deals taken in app, loyalty signups, games played, all of that stitches together pretty nicely in this environment. If you can do it on, on, on an app, you can certainly do it on the web. And so um, our tech powers a lot of website measurement to those same sort of performance outcomes. We just looked at an episodic tune-in one of looking at a specific show and the incrementality of it. Um, we can also do the same thing on, on footfall visitation. And so we can, we can generate footfall events into retail locations and in fact have all those North American retail locations already pre-mapped and, and ready to go. And um, finally, we're starting to pull in some uh, SKU level, uh, purchase level data from big box stores. And so the merchants level, SKU level stuff is, is, is available as well. Again, all plays very well in a clean room environment. Yeah. And those, and, and the measurements, I know this is one example of, of many, uh, but those measurements don't have to be just for clarification, um, an advertiser that uses Kochava for our oh. traditional measurement MMP type services, right? It can be any. Just has to be an advertiser that doesn't want to leak their data. Yep. 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 Yeah, and I know there's different various inputs um, into the clean room environment that would be required in order to basically lean back into these measurable outcome types. But um, that's very interesting. Okay, well, any other um, points, uh, Miguel or Ethan, on this example in particular that, that you would add in or, or great examples that you've seen, um, especially Miguel in, in your seat at the IAB Tech Lab? Uh, no, I think this covers it. I mean, and the, my mind focus has been around activation and measurement. So that's kind of where my mind has been a lot. Uh, but I think this covers um, sort of the overall like that. Activation, right, is when you're using it like with an, an open RTB. Um, and so that covers a lot of use cases, uh, and then um, you know also in measurement in mobile, so to, to track mobile app installs. Um, yeah, so those are the two main cases. I think that's like the umbrella, the umbrella use cases. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think what I would double click on is uh, Grant's point around the, the types of data or outcomes that we're able to unlock through a DCR. So specifically from this list that we're looking at, I, I think all of our uh, you know, our spider senses would go off if we're looking at merchant level purchase data, right? Okay. That's extremely valuable data, either from the first party set standpoint, either on a publisher, advertiser, who you're working with, with a partner, that data is very, very sensitive to be sharing around the ecosystem to get access to, to understand better the outcomes that were being driven by some of your campaigns. So I, I think, you know, as we're, we're talking through use cases, that's a really exciting one where we can start to correlate a lot of these outcomes directly from something like a CTV ad campaign to a purchase in a big box store, right? Like that, that is something that's really cool to see that DCR unlocks. And uh, that would be my, my only double click point on that. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, if, if, if you have um, any interest in, in talking more with Grant or his team, if you're looking at DCR and depending on what measurable outcome uh, you're trying to, you know, measure. Then uh, there is there is a book foundry meeting button at the top of the screen that just sends a note, and we can follow up with you after the webinar. But just want to call out that that's there. Um, let's jump in. I got a couple of questions here, so I'll try and we'll try and get to some of those here shortly. Um, but let's jump into some of the work, Miguel, at the IAB. Uh, specifically around guidance and recommended best practices. Um, and I, I, I assume, right, that most people are familiar with IAB Tech Lab, but in the, in the event that some aren't, can you just give a quick backdrop of IAB, IAB Tech Lab, and the work that you've been doing uh, with them during your tenure there? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, uh, so Tech Lab, I've been here um, a little under two years, um, but basically Tech Lab, uh, is in charge of uh, developing uh, standards, technical standards uh, for the different things that you do in advertising. The biggest one, uh, as you may have heard, is of course OpenRTB, which is real-time programmatic bidding, uh, which empowers a lot of the, the advertising in the open web. Um, so that's like our most famous one. There's also like VAST, which is a video. So if, if you've ever seen like a video ad, it's most likely powered by, by VAST. Um, and then there's also things like ads.txt, uh, and those so those are kind of like our, our bigger ones. We also have like consent, uh, uh, GPP, and TCF. Um, so those are some of the bigger uh, standards. And so that's basically our job. I'm more of a I'm, you know we're basically product managers, and we work <coughs> directly with the company. So we have uh, a lot of member companies, and they essentially sort of join and they um, they spend a lot of time collaborating and putting their technical people to come up with these standards. So. We're not really the ones coming up with the standards. We're just sort of a um, uh, sort of a forum for all these brains to come together and come up with these standards. And so that's basically Tech Lab. That's a great backdrop. Um, so let's talk about this. I, I you put together some slides for us today for for some discussion, and um, I love this one. Can you just speak to this point? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So. Yeah, so essentially uh, at Tech Lab, we wanted to provide some guidance. Uh, there's a lot of challenges around interoperability and, and standardization. Um, but the main problem that we wanna, at least for the for the guidance uh, and, and some of the standards, is uh, that just because you're using a, a data clean room or just because you know, you're know you sharing data, uh, it doesn't mean that your, your data, your user's data is protected, right? Uh, it is extremely important that the data clean rooms implement some sort of um, uh, you know, a, a protective technology. Uh, so pets in this example, uh, things such as basically uh, as basic as encryption, right? Are they encrypting your data? Are they, is it encrypted um, when, while it's stored? Is it encrypted uh, as it moves to transit? Well, are, are users able to, um, uh, to get role level data as Ethan uh, mentioned earlier? Um, and a lot of these things are super important to ask of your vendors uh, to make sure that you know your data is actually protected, um, and you're not just like, oh, it's a clean room, and I can just share whatever, and then you just sort of there's just that assumption. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. So you have to ask these very important questions. And so, uh, next slide. Yeah. And by the way, I've opened a poll in the background. We'll we'll share those results here in just a moment, just on top challenges within your organization to DCR adoption. So if you see that, folks, head over to the polls tab and uh, and vote on that. We'll take a look at those in a moment. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and so, um, and for uh, to sort of empower users to a know what a clean room is and b 
uh, be able to know what kind of question to ask, um, where to poke at other vendors. We put together this uh, guidance and, and best practices, sort of like a primer. So uh, I highly uh, recommend for everybody that wants to learn more about DCRs uh, to check out this guy, uh, this guideline. Uh, essentially, it just uh, talks about what, what problems they solve, their use cases, uh, and more importantly, like what kind of pets uh, can be used with them, uh, where the where can these pets fit in. Uh, a lot of the times, just using one pet doesn't it's not enough. Like you have to use uh, you know multiple. You have to use encryption and differential privacy, for example, to to protect not just the input data but also the output data. It's super important. Um, and also, a lot of the questions that you can ask your vendors: Where does the data sit? Uh, can I can I host it in my own network? And if I host it in my own network, how how is the data shared? Um, you know, what kind of scale do you support? What kind of speed do you support? And so these are all questions that we put together uh, that you can ask in the in the primer and you can check out the primer. Yeah, and I've yeah. got the, uh, within the docs tab that DCR guidelines from the IAB Tech Lab is included. So if that's a resource you wanna jump into, um, feel free to open that. Go ahead, Ethan. Yeah, I was just gonna jump in and say, you know, a lot of the the use cases and, and uh, features within a DCR may seem overly complex. And I think this speaks to the earlier comment about, you know, what qualifies as a DCR versus just something that can help uh, drive performance analysis, right? And just as an example, where how how small these features go is when two parties go into a data clean room, and let's again, go back to that database equivalent where they're executing a SQL statement. One very common thing that is requested is audit logs of the SQL statements that are executed, right? Well, mm. by default, that is a location where you're at risk of data share, just from mm -hmm. an audit log. Like that, that's how unwindable all of these features and how robust data clean rooms need to be to make sure that they're really protecting user privacy, even through those common compute operations that Grant was mentioning before. So just wanted to share that as a use case to say, like as you're evaluating these, as you're talking to vendors, those are the real features that on the surface level, you know, may not seem really important, but uh, are certainly uh, built behind the scenes from, from a lot of the DCR vendors. Yeah. And I'm just I'm sharing the uh, poll results here on screen. Some folks are still actively voting. Um, if you haven't already, please vote. So this is the, what, what do you consider the top challenge? I did make it top, so you can only choose one. You have to make a choice. Uh, and data, data clean room adoption for your organization. Um, so, I, I mean, it's funny that I put it as the top choice. I don't know if that's impacting the voting results, but complexity and technical expertise are in there right now leading the way. Um, so any thoughts on, on this, um, Miguel, Ethan, or Grant, uh, and what you've seen as headwinds and challenges? And then we'll jump into Pair and AdMap and some of those other protocols here in a moment. Yeah, I think yeah, from my it, perspective, uh, sorry, in, in Tech Lab, uh, it's the probably the biggest challenge, right? It's overcoming these technical uh, hurdles. Um, you know, we want to implement things like cryptography, like just to give you an example, like, uh, uh, you know, using cryptography, but then who who holds the keys, right? And who has to do the actual encryption? Um, and so when that adds burden, that adds burden yeah. to the to the publishers and advertisers, and then if they if they delegate that work, then does that defeat the purpose of some of these techniques? And how do you solve that? How do you uh, how do you solve for that? So these are some of the challenges that we're still kind of going through and attempting to solve a tech lab. Uh, but also, yeah, for sure, I think that's the biggest hurdle that, that we see. Yeah, and I, I would definitely agree. I was just going to call out on the the second one. I I don't know if these are the orders of the poll, but I love that the top two are. Uh, what they are. Interoperability mm -hmm. and standardization, I think, is just from the MMP lens and, and how we serve our customers, one of the biggest hurdles that we have to solve for, right? Um, by nature of a DCR, it typically is not something, uh, it is a vendor selection is the, the short of it, which means that we have to work with many, many DCRs as a measurement provider as we're going through this, and not all DCRs are created equal, right? So there's a lot of challenges that you have to, to work through on how data is even being shared across DCR. That could be cross vendors that are selected from individual advertisers or publishers. And that you know ties up a little to the complexity and technical expertise, but a lot of the interoperability and standardization around how data shared, how outputs look, that is a, a really key key thing to lean in on for sure. Yeah, it's yeah. uh you know, Seema's asking a really interesting question here, which yeah, completely exactly. ties into this uh into this poll. 
if I read this in order, complexity, I just read as complexity. Folks aren't don't understand it. There's all like if you even just talk about one of these things we've mentioned, like multi-party compute, there's different flavors, right? And it gets super deep, super quick. So I understand that it's getting better. And I think folks, a lot of this will get automated so folks don't have to think about it. But if I look at that interoperability and collaboration, to me, those largely fall on the legal issues in terms of I have, you know, and after having worked with with hundreds, if not thousands of brands at this point, there are no two brands that approach this the same way from a legal standpoint, right? Some brands are uh, willing to say, hey, the IP hasn't been litigated yet, so we'll use it. Other brands are like, we will not use that. That is, we adorn, we, we consider that PII. So it's, um, this is a this is a tough one for folks to solve. I would say rely on the IAB. They have a really really good point of view on on sort of what is usable in what environments for what purpose, um, and that can provide some pretty good guidance. But even that meets headwinds at the brand level, from what I've seen. Yeah, yeah, Miguel. Any thoughts for for Seema's question here? Um, I mean, maybe the, the, I don't know if they've already looked at the DCR guidelines and take that as a measure to approach potential DCR vendors. But um, any thoughts you have on that? Uh, yeah, definitely check out the the primer. Um, I think a lot of that like differs from vendor to vendor. Um, so they'll have sort of different uh, techniques for you to ship over your data to them. So I would think that's more like a vendor. Uh, if there's any opportunities to standardize things, I would love to to hear more about it. Um, but I think from my point of view, it's, it's sort of like uh, it, you have to ask the vendor and see how you have to ship your data over. I recommend that you at least, you know, definitely ask about encryption and, and how, how your data is going to be protected. Um, but you have to talk to your vendor, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Okay, well, let's see. Um, let me, um, we have some other great questions, so we'll try and we'll try and peel off some of these here as well. Um, but let's go ahead and really quickly talk through on the, on the whole point of interoperability and standardization and uh, even scalability, some of the things that the IAB is working on from a, a protocol standpoint. So let me jump to this one here. So let's uh, dive into pair uh, first. And if, if you can speak to this, uh, Miguel, and just let me know when you want to move forward in a slide. For sure, for sure. Uh, yeah, so pair uh, is essentially this protocol uh, for activation uh, that was developed uh, initially by Google for their um, DV, for their DSP. And um, and they recently donated it to IAB Tech Lab so that it can become like a truly open standard. They, they donated the IP. Um, and so we're now, well, Tech Lab is now the steward of, of Pair. Um, and we just released uh, some updates to the, to the original Pair protocol. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, and Pair is essentially, uh, I'll talk about the updates in a second, but Pair is essentially just uh, a, standard, a standard technique uh, for generating uh, activation activation or targeting list in such a way uh, that you're not sharing uh, your private information uh, well you know your 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 users information with a, with anybody and it uses uh, it's, it uses something called commutative encryption I'm not going to get into the details uh, too much but essentially it's sort of uh, commutative encryption is like when you have a piece of data and in the case of pair it's triple encrypted. And the beauty of it is that you can encrypt it in any order, uh, and then you can decrypt it like uh, again, regardless of the order um, of uh, of the encryption keys. Uh, so you can triple encrypt it, and then in one order, and then decrypt it uh, in a in a different order, and you're going to come out with the same data. So that's sort of uh, the core technology that it uses. Uh, go on to the next slide. Um, yeah. So so yeah. Again, I, I don't want to get too much into the details, but essentially. Uh, you you encrypt your data as a publisher and advertiser, um, and there is a social. So that's two keys. Well, you know, one for that advertiser, one for the publisher. Then there's a third key, which is called like the session key. Uh, you encrypt your data. You uh, you uh, the DCR basically does a lot of that work uh, for you, and uh, and then it outputs this encrypted, triple encrypted um, uh, uh, targeting list, which then you can then upload to your DSP. And you you know the the beauty of being, uh, using a standard is that regardless of what data cleaner you're using or what DSP you're using, it's going to be the exact same technique. So you can, you know, uh, be working with different vendors. Uh, as an advertiser, you, you're going to be working with different publishers that use different vendors. And so that's why it was so important to, to standardize this um, sort of this, this workflow. 
uh, and so some of the updates that we did within uh, within Tech Lab is um, there's also cases where we see like one you know one advertiser using one vendor and then the publisher using a different vendor. And so how do you solve for that use case? We're not you're not just using like one 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 sort of core central uh, DTR. You have the, these two separate ones. How do you solve for that? So we included that in the in the updates. Uh, we also included a, an implementation using a TE. So for those that don't know, a TE is essentially a trusted execution environment, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more a little bit later on. Um, and then we also have a pre-bid module. So if you're a publisher uh, and you want to just sort of uh, use the you know use pair, uh, you can use the pre-bid module. We're making some updates to that as well, which uh, the updates will be released in the coming months. Um, but this is already live. Um, uh, in the future, we do have a sort of like a compliance on. on you know, unfortunately, it's not perfect. Uh, there are some parts uh, where we need to enforce compliance uh, so that uh, to minimize data leakage. So it's it's still I would say it's not perfect. Uh, we, there's still some some work that that we need to be done to sort of make it cryptographically perfect. So you still need some sort of compliance. So, but in, you minimize compliance, right? Like in this case, you're, you're you're minimizing compliance to the DSP. So the DSPs will need to be uh, you know uh, certified. Uh, as opposed to like you know having to to and then that that sort of uh, guarantees uh, sort of the the correctness and the and you know the the, the cryptographic privacy privacy guarantees of the protocol um, as opposed to an, you know if you are using pair like there's so many uh, sort of potential um, you know uh, loops and and bugs that you could uh, that, that you can uncover um, so anyways so yeah so we're doing this compliance program and uh, yeah you can see the adoption here. Uh, currently, just three three clean rooms. Uh, hopefully, more. It's already uh, available in OpenRTB, so you can uh, again from pre uh, from the pre bin module go into OpenRTB, and uh, yeah, we're hoping to increase uh, you know increase um, adoption as we as we move forward with pair. So this is sort of like uh, the yin is the activation, and then the yang, which is the measurement, which I'll talk about in a second. Yeah, yeah. Any any um, and I know I think. Um, Pair essentially replaced what the o OPJA, um, so that it's kind of a supplanting of that, correct? Yeah, yeah. So if you've heard uh, about OPJA, uh, it's basically this uh, this replaced it. Um, this this adds some sort uh, a few per, um, performance uh, improvements, uh, mainly around the, like not needing to decrypt data in real time, which which added a little bit of lag in OPJA. Uh, you don't need that with Pair. Um, so yeah, so that so if you if you would have heard about OPJ, I uh, just know that pair is sort of like the the new version, and you should focus on pair instead. Yeah, that sounds like this pair will really will help. A number of the things you said seem to address the notion of the interoperability in certain use cases, especially the ability to work with multiple DCRs, right? If the supply side versus buy side is different, or um, but yeah, so that's very interesting in terms of standardization efforts. Um, let me uh, quickly let's let's jump into ad map next but i want to grab um one of these questions uh so someone just asked where the primer is there's in the docs tab uh we have links out to iab's dcr guidelines we have links out to both uh pair as well as ad map um iab documentation as well so if you are technical and you're interested in diving further into that uh feel free to check out those resources um so one question before we jump into ad map do you see, uh, and let me see if I can share this on screen here real fast, just so you can see the uh, visual here. So do you see any use cases for a DCR as an extension of a CDP, a customer data platform? Um, any of you wanna, wanna take that? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to uh, chime in. And I, I think Grant, you might have some additional comments, but uh, you know, I, I think that the short answer is ab absolutely. Um, when we talk about how data flows into a DCR, how data is hydrated, a, a lot of the times we're, we're talking about things like SDK footprint or having the ability to capture some of the uh, first party data that you have across all of your, your different consumer sides. And, um, you know, I think Miguel's done a, a really good job painting the picture of how data clean rooms emerge out into these areas like activation and what we'll see uh, coming up next on the measurement side. It's no different from when we're capturing data on the consumer side, right? And especially going into something like a, a DCR, we need to start seeing a lot more privacy guarantees on first party data capture. And I think what we'll see is a lot of standards coming out on how data is being pushed even into a DCR environment. 
Um, without getting too into the weeds, I, I think for, for folks that are familiar with standards like uh, the SK Ad Network or even Google Privacy Sandbox, while those don't necessarily fall under the category of ADCR, they certainly fall under the camp of uh, privacy enhancing technologies. And they really focus on that data capture side that enables some of these business use cases. And for a DCR to be equivalent to that, I think will also be held to a certain standard around data capture, largely from, like I said, SDK or first party data capture, leaving device, leaving edge systems, coming into a, a server side environment like a DCR. That's great. No, thanks for jumping on that one. Well, let's, uh, I've got other questions that I want to get to those too. Let's jump back into um, AdMap. Uh, and can you speak through this real fast, Miguel? Uh, and, and let me know when you want to proceed to the next yeah. slide. Uh, for sure, for sure. So AdMap is sort of like the, um, the complementary to Pair. So as I mentioned, Pair is for activation. AdMap is for measurement. Um, essentially what it is, it's just, uh, it's a protocol that, you know, allows the advertisers uh, and publishers to share data and provide certain privacy guarantees. Uh, one of them being that you're not exposing your audience data to the other party. Uh, so it, it also, it actually guarantees that even the data clean room cannot, uh, cannot learn information about your, um, your audience as well. Uh, so it, it does this by uh, utilizing more advanced uh, pets, uh, which I'll talk about in a, in a second. Uh, and yeah, it's built on some of the foundations uh, that OPJA uh, and Pair um, are also built on. Uh, but really, it's um, it, the use case is around that uh, that measurement part and how can a data clean room actually do the measurement while providing these privacy guarantees. Um, so that's what I get into. So I'll go to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, so as I mentioned before. Um, AdMap was developed by uh, some, you know, very smart people, uh, PhDs from uh, these different companies that came together and collaborated um, to make uh, to make AdMap. Same with, you know, just like Pair and OPJA. Um, so, uh, what are basically the the, the were, this is the outline of the document. Uh, if you look at the at the AdMap document, what essentially what we go through is like what are the the, the, the design goals of uh, AdMap. Uh, what, you know, which is uh, privacy of, of the user identity, privacy of the audience membership. Um, if we break it up into two steps <clears throat> for simplicity uh, and for uh, for basically you can sort of separate these two processes, which is uh, there's the mapping process and then there's the attribution process, which I'll kind of, I won't get too into it, but I'll talk about it briefly. Um, we'll talk about the, and so one of the challenges here is we wanted to, yeah, make standardized workflows and standardize as, as much as we could. Um, without inhibiting what data clean rooms can do. So, you know, data clean rooms obviously need to compete with each other and need to be able to, uh, you know, provide like different sort of uh, conversion algorithms and different features. And so if we standardize that, um, then, you know, we, I think you lose a lot of the ability for them to compete with each other. And so we didn't want to over standardize. So, um, so we talk a little bit about like the, the data interfaces, how do you ship data in and out? Uh, but we're not prescriptive about everything. So uh, we do have some reference implementations, which I talk about. Um, uh, one, which is for the for the mapping, which uses uh, private set intersection, which is basically using confidential computing. Uh, the mapping is uh, slightly less uh, intensive. And what, this is why you can use PSI, because with PSI, um, you can do these computations uh, relatively, you know, without spending too much money. But for doing like attribution, which is a lot more compute heavy, um, we we recommend to have an implementation using a trusted execution environment because if you were to use like a PSI or a, a confidential computing for that it would be way too expensive. And these are things mm -hmm. like like W3C and Sandbox and all of them looked at uh, and they all pretty much arrived at the same conclusion is you need to use like a TE because anything else would be too expensive essentially. Uh, so next, yeah, next slide. I think this one has a has a diagram here. I don't know if, how visible it is to the audience, but. If you want to speak yeah. through this, and then we can jump into some other questions. Yeah, for sure. Feel free to interrupt me, um, uh, but I'll definitely, definitely touch on uh, TEs and sandbox uh, in a second. Um, but it's uh, mapping. Uh, it's basically um, AdMap is composed of two phases. One is the mapping uh, phase, where you essentially um, can share your encrypted data, uh, fully encrypted data. And uh, you essentially uh, do the the operation on the encrypted data to generate uh, sort of this 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 crosswalk of of identity data, 
And so you put in like a, a, a hashed email or, or an encrypted email and you get out uh, an, a sort of a random ID that you don't know what it means. Um, and so you, you know you basically get back this the random ID for every input row that you put in. And so you don't know whether what matched with the publisher and what didn't match. All you get back is this randomized ID. Uh, and the, the other party also gets gets back the, the same thing. Um, and so, it, and, and then the, um, the mapping phase can also implement like ID vendors. So if you're working with any sort of ID vendors that uh, resolve the IDs for you, this is where they would fit in. Uh, they're super important. Like ID vendors are still super important. Uh, so you don't have to use like just an email, but you can augment, you know, certain uh, attributes that you have to create like, uh, you know, uh, some sort of ID that you may be using from different vendors. So uh, that's it on the mapping. Yeah, uh, next one. Yeah, so you don't have to just use an email. You can you can work with um, ID vendors. Yeah, as I mentioned, for mapping, uh, our reference implementation uses the PSI. Uh, but for attribution, uh, basically, uh, the, the way that it works, so this is the workflow, is they each share what conversion and exposure data, events, level uh, level data, along with that um, that identity, that sort of that crosswalk identity that you receive from the from the mapping phase. And again, this is uh, the mapping phase is optional. If you're comfortable sharing just like hashed emails, or if you're okay comfortable just um, sharing like you know from your ID vendor, and you already have that common ID space, you can skip this uh, the mapping step altogether and just ship that over to the uh, the attribution system. Uh, and the attribution system uses a TE. And in case you don't know, a TE is essentially um, a system that basically guarantees that the code that you expected to run is what's actually running. So if you expect the code not to share any data, um, to put certain guards in place, uh, you, that's basically it's guaranteed that that's what's actually running on the TE. And so the attribution system has different subcomponents, which uh, one of them is the reporting and aggregation system. So it it uh, matches, uh, aggregates, and then reports. Um, and the reporting can use something like uh, can augment, can use uh, like differential privacy to to preserve that. So. Um, we don't have like set standards for all that. Uh, we provide guidelines. The main guideline here is um, how you ship the data to use a TEE uh, and, to, uh, and to guard your output data. And we do have a reference implementation of how you actually compute your conversions, but it's loosely defined. So you can you can have your own conversion models here as well. So we're, it's, it's not like just uh, set in stone. You, can, you don't lose any of that flexibility. Uh, and so that's a, that was the goal. Uh, so next, next one. Hey Miguel, real real quick, just go back real quick. A couple of questions Sorry. on that last slide. Hey, go back to that last slide, would you, Jeff? Yeah. So, and I don't. This is sort of a weird question, but in your experience, who owns what on this slide? Like, let's say the keys, right? So you got to have somebody who's managing your keys. You got to have somebody who's managing that the aggregation rules are actually being followed and adhered to. Like we've yeah. got a lot of parties involved here. What does that What does that typically look like in your experience? In mine, it, it's it's look different ways every time. Yeah, right. yeah. There's like there's like the ideal world, and then there's like the real yeah. world, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So ideally, right? Like each publisher holds their own encryption keys. Each pub and advertiser does the same, and then each party does their own encryption and their own system using their own code that they you know that they verify, and then they don't leak data. Uh, and then they independently, if you're using a TE, they can do use the attestation system of a TE, yep. uh, which different cloud providers do, and they can attest to the code, they can check the code. In reality, that's not going to happen, right? Because it's just so much more burden on the advertisers and publishers. Um, so uh, uh, what we've been seeing happening is that the DCRs actually uh, sort of launch these components uh, in, the, in the networks of the advertisers and publishers. And so they do a lot of this work for them. They manage the keys for them, but in such a way where it still lives in their network. Uh, and then the attestation, we're still sort of working on that, but we're thinking maybe perhaps the IAB Tech Lab has a role to play where we can attest these different TEs. And it's super low, um, you know, I would say super, well, I don't want to say it's easy, but I think it's, it's better if somebody like the Tech Lab does it uh, to remove that burden, right? So you can say like, hey, uh, we're cryptographically checking the attestation of this TE system, and they're basically cryptographically certified. So it's not a real, it's not like a certification. It's like crypt cryptographically based. Um, and so we think probably Tech Lab might be doing a lot of that attestation. No, we're the not reason, sure. And I think you got to it is that the you know the the reason I was asking that question is is typically in lieu of of a clear path 
you need a trusted third party to manage this stuff. And, and it's quite frankly, it's why we've been running clean rooms as a service a little bit because it is quite a bit to manage. And you do need somebody who's actually managing the attestation of this stuff and making sure that that it is um, is doing what, what all parties think it should be. And along with key management can be a bit of a nightmare. So, yeah. Um, yeah. All right. I can also, um, so oh. I can also mention about how this compares to Sandbox, uh, if, if you're interested. Yeah, let's jump uh, into that in a second. We, we're getting uh, down to the final 10 here, but I, and I wanted to bring up this question kind of back to ownership, right, if you will. And Grant, maybe you can take this, Ethan, too, from a Cochava side, but Adrian had the question of, do you consider yourself a measurement provider on top of DCR? And then she's got some some different KPIs there, or Adrian's got some different KPIs in, in little parenthetical reference there, but any comment to that? Uh, if you're asking me specifically, yes, we do provide measurement on top of data clean rooms, and it's typically to the to the performance KPIs that that mobile marketers are used to. So think like um, uh, conversion rate for loyalty signups and the different post install event apps. It, it, it does back out to LTV, particularly within the media and entertainment folks. We see a lot of that. So. Yeah, but it's that's not all of it, though. I mean, a lot of it is just literally setting up the data connections and environments and letting people run their own measurement, which we've done um, plenty and are happy to do as well, because it, it can be quite a bit to manage. Yeah. Even I don't know whether you have anything else. That, that's exactly what I was going to hit on is, you know, from from our role, we certainly have uh, a lot of, of really good um, opinions and techniques that we can use around measurement on top of the data. Um, but again, a lot of the stuff that we're doing is facilitating the partnerships across the ecosystem. And I, I don't want to point back and, and call it similar to a CDP um, too much, but that's the large majority. Um, and there's pros and cons of that. One really big pro that we've experienced with some customers is uh, if you have something secret sauce that you're doing that uh, is a part of how you determine measurement should be done that does not have to get exposed to MMP partners or publishers or other partners in the space. That is a uh, approved compute workload that can take place on the data that's shared between parties in the, the, the ecosystem without any even technique exposure of what's being done. Okay. Um, so a lot of really cool benefits, but uh, absolutely, I would, I would say, uh, you know, everything Grant said as well. Yeah. And um, real quick, I, you had mentioned uh, some resources. I had a slide. I'm jumping forward here for the sake of time, Miguel. But those, uh, again, in the docs tab, we have links out to those IAB resources for the DCR guidelines, pair and ad map, if you're interested in exploring those further. Um, I want to jump in quickly here to kind of future cast data clean rooms in light of everything we're seeing in mobile on, on Apple, right? With things like scan, which we talked about and the HTT framework and a, yeah. a world where, right? Set, set the stage for a future world, maybe starting with you, Grant, where we don't have maids, IPs, like what yeah. does measurement look like? The, the good news is, and you know, one of the, the takeaway I want folks to know is if, if you're using an MMP, you have the ability to generate remarkable first party data which can be used for targeting and measurement and the clean room is a bit of an answer here because you can create theoretically events being instrumented through your sdk by your mmp that in combination can create a better than probabilistic match although that's the type of data you can't have leak out into the ecosystem right and so there's lots and lots of opportunity here then in, in a world where ip and maids go away as long as an SDK is on device, uh, clean rooms provide a heck of an answer. And so if you have any questions around that, I, I recommend uh, folks get in touch. It gets pretty complicated. The good news is we've been through it quite a bit, um, but there is, a, there is a future state for us here and, and, and DCR is a, is a big solve to it. Yeah. And Amy, I wanted to bring up a question we actually got during registration from uh, someone uh, that asked, will the majority of data clean rooms evolve to be A, their own connective tissue between data spaces, or B, a key feature of a cloud environment, e.g. Snowflake? It seems like the larger players will go towards B and force their smaller partners that way, but also people will need A. Um, <laughs> any, any thought to that, like as we think about the future evolution of DCRs? 
I would say, uh, well, well said. I think the answer is both. Um, we are seeing a big standardization, largely for the complexity that we've talked through on how these get implemented from a lot of cloud uh, or SaaS vendors in the space, Snowflake's one, Amazon, GCP, all of the major vendors really have DCR capabilities. Um, the key element though is in point A, which is interoperability of that then becomes one of the big hurdles that we're, we're really talking about. We will continue to see pointed solutions in the DCR space that are really trying to create the standards of how these services talk together while still meeting those privacy guarantees that we have. So, um, you know, I think over the last year, what I've observed in the DCR space is, um, you know, I would say previously, it was a focus on getting those privacy guarantees uh, set within the, the actual platforms. This last year, I've seen a overwhelming push towards interoperability between vendors. Um, so whether or not that's Snowflake to Amazon or Snowflake mm -hmm. to Google or others, Block Graph's a really good example of some of this as well. Those are starting to work interoperability or uh, interoperable together and allow us to still do our our, our measurement uh, on those platforms. Yeah. And there was another question that came in as well around how do you overcome the lack of real time data ingestion and outbound processing inside the clean room? I don't know if Miguel, you have any thoughts on that or Ethan or Grant? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, I, I don't think you know. I don't think you need real time processing. In fact, uh, if you ha if you would were to have real time processing, it actually breaks some of the data privacy guarantees because you can actually leak uh, user information that way. So if you look at things systems like Sandbox, for example, they implement uh, delays on purpose. Um, so you you don't need this in real time. You know this is not like real time bidding. You're not you not you don't need to take action like within the millisecond. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't think I don't think you need it, and it breaks privacy. Yeah, and I I think my my answer is uh, somewhat similar. I think I would look more holistically outside of of DCR. DCR certainly solves a lot of things in some places, like with pair, we could potentially could get in to support real-time targeting um, or you know, activation use cases, those are things that uh, we can start to do. But I look at the privacy space as a spectrum, right? So we have privacy enhancing technologies like SCAD and uh, GPS. They're not quite real-time, but they're near, very near real-time on the signals that we're getting while still maintaining the privacy guarantees. We see uh, incrementality and MMM coming out which uh, you know are, are things that we're starting to get more cross-channel signal into without breaking consumer privacy guarantees. And then we have DCR, which is where I would say uh, you may not need the same real-time guarantees to be able to do a lot of the analysis that you're doing. I think that's where I would say clarity in what you're actually trying to measure comes to the forefront versus the real-time. Getting the exact answer that you're looking for via uh, you know, non real time analysis is where they really shine. And you can use that to further guide decision making going forward. And can you um, either Ethan or Grant just speak real fast to, you know, from a Kochava perspective, obviously we touched on some use cases here today where we're sitting atop of AWS DCR, right? But um, as we think about a Kochava identity link that a lot of our customers use for the purpose of really identity resolution and, and some of that crosswalking within their, between their apps, across platforms and, and what we're looking to do from a native DCR um, approach. Yeah, yeah and that's really yeah. on the back of, of what you can do with an SDK. I'll let, I'll let Ethan talk to it a, a, a bit, but at the end of the day, it's an identifier that's specific to the brand that doesn't leak, that allows cross app connectivity within a brand. So it's, it's massively powerful. It has tons of use cases. Ethan, I'll shut up. I wanna get to your AI yeah. thing. Then I'm so <laughs> curious. We're not going to have time. Let's do that in no, next no, one. Yeah, DCR. We'll, we'll tease it. Yep, Gen AI <laughs> yeah. and DCR. That's a good teaser. <laughs> I, I wouldn't add anything else really on the identity uh, side in our, our identity locker solution. Crosswalk capability is where we've really been focused. That's something that predates DCR as a, as a concept. We've been doing it for a lot of years at Coachava. And I think we'll continue to be leaning in on that front with a lot of the IAB standards as the forefront, which we covered today. So. A um, lot of lot of cool things that we can do in the DCR space, and if you haven't looked into them or uh, are on the fence, definitely definitely reach out. Happy to chat through some of the use cases. Yeah, 
Well, this was not enough time. Uh, we'll, we'll have to do a part two at some point and uh, get you back, Miguel. Um, DCR is a complicated topic, so I'm thankful for technical experts like yourself. So, um, Ethan, Grant, Miguel, thank you for joining today, and uh, thank you to the audience as well. Have a have a wonderful uh, rest of your day or evening. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you.